So next, uh, one, of the, one of the pleasures we always have of this conference is to hear from your own. And in one of the talks that we generally always try and have, and I know many of you in the, in the room have, have done this talk yourself, is to learn a little bit more about your Kansas operation, how it's developed, how it's grown, kind of current status, and, and the opportunities and challenges that you've faced in your time in the pork industry. We're very fortunate to have Grant Morgan uh, with Polky Feeders uh, be part of this presentation uh, this year. Uh, he helps oversee the pork production and special project areas, uh, purchasing of the company. He was previously employed by IMI Global, which he served as a director of auditing for animal verification. Um, along with uh, the swine business, and, and Grant will go through how their swine business integrates. Pokey Feeders is a large uh, commercial cattle feeding operation, and both those ventures are joined together in the same location where the sows are, and then the cattle feeding operation. So again, diverse, diversification within that livestock uh, business that they have. Uh, Grant is an uh, alumni of Kansas State University, and let's give him a warm welcome, and uh, we look forward to his information on their operation. Good morning. Can everybody hear me all right? I want to start by saying um, thank you to Kansas State for allowing me to come speak today. Um, speaking in front of large groups isn't necessarily my forte, so I'd like everyone to bear with me. I go through my presentation, I want to start with a rhetorical question. Um, as I looked at Dr. Scholl's and Dr. Johnson's presentations, it's, um, I ask myself, why do we continue to punish ourselves and not try to stay profitable for a few extra years and not grow our herd? I'd like to say thank you to the KSU staff, the attendees, everyone that's helped set up and tear down this event, the vendors that are here, and specifically Dr. Goodman, who's done a tremendous amount for myself. Who is Pokey Feeders? Uh, we're a 145,000 one-time cattle feeding operation, uh, lease and own ranches in six states, uh, about 83,000 acres of owned ground, 270,000 acres of leased ground. Pork production, we have a sow farm in western Kansas and uh, involved in several private equity investments. Uh, we were founded in 1980. Our name comes from a, a town in Iowa called Pocahontas, Iowa. Uh, the original 10 owners in Pokey Feeders were from the Hamilton and Pocahontas counties in Iowa. Uh, my family is originally from southwest Iowa. We moved down to Kansas um, in 1985, and today is actually my dad's 33rd year um, owning and managing our company. Um, our cattle feeding makes up of four feed yards, three in Kansas, one in Nebraska. Our main feed yard, Pokey Feeders, 85,000 head capacity. Brookover Cattle Company, uh, 28,000 head capacity. Lloyd Waller Feedlot in Holdridge, Nebraska, 20,000, and Ranger Feeders, which is in Dighton, Kansas. Our ranches include uh, three that we own, uh, the P5 Ranch, 45,000 acres, Meat Hook, 30,000 acres, and what we call Walrika Farms. Our South Farm is right at today 3,800 head. How we got into the South Farm, the pig business, uh, both my dad and his partner, both Iowa farm boys, raised hogs, raised cattle. Uh, but a friend of theirs, a gentleman by the name of Bruce Ratstetter in 1996, um, who owned Heartland Pork at the time, wanted a farm in an unpig populated area and built a gilt development unit at that time. Um, lo and behold, fast forward a few years, uh, tough market, Tough Health, um, a neighbor that builds 50,000 finishing spaces across from us. I come back to the operation not knowing a thing about pigs and still don't. Um, with 20% finishing death loss, PERS, MICO, FLU, positive every year. Um, we started out with the uh, idea that I was going to take over the pork production. We moved uh, a few more years down the road from there. Um, 
I was lucky enough to find three individuals that helped transform our production. Um, first was our farm manager we hired uh, from Nebraska Pork, who happened to be in their top three uh, farm managers. Uh, found arguably one of the best consulting vets, Dr. Tim Lulla, and found a, a pig belt buckle wearing nutritionist named Dr. Goodband. Fast forward another 10 years later, uh, we filtered our farm about seven years ago, uh, built a guilt development unit, and today I put a performance in our profitability up against anybody. How do we keep our company out of the ditch? Um, I could list about 50 items. Uh, today what I want to talk about is risk management and how we look at it. To me, risk management starts with production. Uh, without good to great performance at the sow and finishing levels, I don't care what secret risk management, commodity broker, get rich, commission, churn, and scheme you have. It starts at the sow farm with good immunity. Good sow immunity starts the stage for good performance, in my opinion. Our simple goal to profitability. I can't claim this is my idea. Uh, this comes from a gentleman who uh, is well respected to myself named John Rakestraw mentor of myself and my fathers who ran Continental Grain, their cattle feeding division when they were in their heyday. But the idea of it is, is here's the industry, pro oh, whoops. The idea is, um, draw a graph, any graph, and say this is the industry profitability. For example, we got market, oops. Where's the pointer at, Joel? Thank you. So for example, say we go through a time period here making $10, go back to losing 20, back to making 20. Our goal is to be two or three dollars above the industry average. when We're making money and two or three dollars better than the industry when we're losing money. How do we do that? We start with measuring our performance. South Farm benchmarking, we need to finish benchmarking. The following data I'm going to show you is our performance win to finish data. Just a few random slides just to show you where we've come from and where we're at today. Um, I want to say another thank you to Dr. Goodban. He spent a tremendous amount of time and work for us uh, putting all this data together that I look at on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Our average daily gain from 2010 to 2018. Um, last year we averaged 166. We need to finish. Well, the main thing we look at is our value to increase in our average daily gain. We picked up $1.36 if Doc's math's right. Our fee conversion year over year is our biggest opportunity this year for us. Um, we averaged $2.52 marketing right at $2.90. Value to improve in feed efficiency. Mortality by year, um, we were PERS positive last year. Like I said, we're a filtered farm. Um, I could really go honestly either way on being filtered anymore. Um, it's a lot of work. I believe in the system, but when we put it in seven years ago, the statistic was, I think, 13% break rate. You came into it every year. I don't know what it is today, but we've kind of averaged right about breaking uh, one, uh, two out of every three years. With our guilt development herd, our unit, uh, we, we maintain per st stable status. Value to improving mortality. Percent pigs marketed per year, uh, 95.6 is what we averaged 2018 at. This is the biggest piece of information that I look at, is our lost opportunity sheet that uh, Dr. Goodman puts together for us. Um, We've weaned over the years. I carry about 19 growers weaned to finish um, in northwest Iowa and a couple in southwest Minnesota. Um, as you can see, my best grower to my worst grower is about $22 per head. And that's kind of the moral of my story when it comes to risk management. If you don't have good performance, you know, you can't hedge $22 on a poor grower. He's not with me this year. Our bell curve, 
was a lot worse when we got started. Things we're focused on this year, forced pulling pigs. Some of you guys might be f familiar with that philosophy, but it's something that we pound on on a daily basis with our growers. Uh, we force pull on day five and day 10. Uh, we pull about 5% of the pigs, give them a shot of a low-level antibiotic, put them away, gruel those pigs. Uh, we do that again at day 10 just to get this, the, the pigs started properly. Our goal is to be right at half a percent death loss by day 50. We have a bonus accordingly for that. Next biggest thing is our late-term deads, what we manage as our last 30 days on feed. To me, our biggest driver in feed conversion um, outside of getting the pig started is those deads the last 30 days. One thing that I look at um, that I think our industry and, and the pork industry, where we go back to our cattle side of our business, um, in the cattle world, we feed cattle the top 25% of the pig or of the cattle. Uh, we don't feed the averages. And so we maintain our diets on our pig finishing levels um, to try to go after the top 25%. You know, I want to know what those pigs weigh when I take my first cut out, you know, 135 days. That's the pigs I want to uh, set my nutrition up for. Next big thing that we're working on that we're just closing out our first, uh, probably last five or six closeouts, uh, been fully pelleted the whole way through. Uh, really looking at, you know, marketing about 290, getting down to that 2-3 feet conversion. Why production, is, why, uh, production is so important for risk management? Uh, we pride ourselves in having some of the best contract growers in the business. I carry no contracts, but I have a huge incentive program for them. Uh, we give a cruise away or a trip to Vegas every year, and I pay about 40 to 60,000 in bonuses a year to my contract growers. And I only market about 100,000 pigs per year. Give my best grower to my worst grower is $22 per head last year. But my average growers still market 97% of their pigs. And they're $6 behind my best grower. Risk management to me is just not about hedging. Uh, we ship isola weans to Northwest Iowa instead of feeding them in Kansas. I'm trapped where I'm at. I only have two places I can market pigs, one being seaboard or Triumph if I wanted to go all the way to St. Joe. I don't like that risk, so I'd rather move to Iowa where I have cheaper grain. You know, on average, about 20 cents a bushel, 25 cents a bushel cheaper. Historically, was a lot better. Um, but with ethanol concentration, it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, it's gotten a lot tighter basis narrowing. Uh, I can, you know, I can freight 18, 1900 pigs on an ISOE truck for a dollar a head versus freighting a fat hog around. So. Those are some of the things why we've moved our pig to Northwest Iowa. Again, it uh, starts with production. Our he hedging strategy is simple. Uh, we manage margin period. I really don't care where the market's at, where it's going. Um, there's margin, I'm going to take it. Uh, we're regularly hedged nine months out. That's the beauty of our business. Um, I've purchased pigs in the open market. I've fed a lot of finishing contracts. I don't do any formulas. I want to know, I only do flat price pigs. I want to know where my pig, my pig cost is going to be a year from now. So if the market's going to give me an opportunity, I'm going to take it. Um, it's been my experience in the market that, you know, we typically have a premium. Um, we call it risk premium, call it what you want. But you look at October and December futures today, trading 69, 64. I mean, I've been hedging those all week. Um, started hedging February at 67. It's great margin out there uh, for historically where we'll be at. Why not take it? You know, I'm not a three-way caller, window guy, whatever you want to call it, buying a put, selling a call, selling an option. I don't like that risk. I feel most people don't understand their downside risk on selling an option because um, what's your exit strategy? When I get into a position, I want to know how I'm going to get out of it. Um, selling options to me is a volatility play. It's not a directional play. I'm a, pilot. I'm a pilot by trade. Um, I actually went to K-State Salina through their flight school. I grew up in a feed yard and thought that there's no way in hell I'm coming back to a feed yard. <laughs> so I went through that whole road and uh, wound up coming back. But one thing we always thought of in flying and one thing we, we taught as, as flight instructors is you always want to be in front of the airplane. You know, you never want the airplane flying you. You know, 90-some percent of accidents in, in flying are resulted back to pilot error. 
So I think that's the same way when you take it into risk management or running a company, doing anything, but you want it yourself, you want yourself in a position where you're managing the risk, not the risk managing you. I use futures to hedge, not packer contracts. I carry basis contracts, but I use those when I'm done with my hedges. I want the flexibility to get in and out. I manage my grain with basis and forward price, pricing. Typically when I hedge, my strategy is pretty simple. I'm going to look at some point in time. If I can't do it that day, I'm going to buy puts. So I have the opportunity at some point in time, hopefully in that six, nine, 12 months out that I'm hedging pigs, that I can cover those hedges and still have that upside potential and still maintain a fully hedged, pro fully hedged program. I don't, don't buy many calls, I don't sell many puts. Once I've taken advantage, back to that, once I've taken advantage of the premium in the back, um, if I'm not given the opportunity to buy puts, so what? I'll live with it. We look for singles and doubles, we're not after home runs. Uh, the market usually gives you a chance to do something. Uh, the spread market is another area that we use to increase our margin. Uh, seasonal crazy market moves. You know, I believe in studying the spread market. Uh, there's good opportunity there. Fundamentals still matter in spreads. Uh, my father is a, is a mentor of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, who's actually stepping down from running our organization in three days. Um, and I'll, I'll have the opportunity to take over our operation on the 8th of February. But a few of his old adages, uh, that he believes in to this day and, and has done a phenomenal job uh, when it comes to risk management. We believe in feeding the market. We do a little business every day. Uh, we don't try for home runs, singles and doubles win the game. And when we can, we're all about equity preservation. And the last thing that I've had to learn the most of is there's a pig, paddle big enough for everybody's, you know what. I'll leave with this. Um, Success is a pile of failure that comes to you standing on, or comes that you are standing on, excuse me. What people think it looks like, and what it really looks like. That's all I got. Thank you, Grant, uh, from your perspective and, and kind of how you went through. We have some time for a few questions. Um, if uh, Anybody has questions for Grant, that would be a time we could do that now. I may have one to start off with. So as you ship your pay, ship your ISO weans uh, to your location, how do you work with growers? You know, you're, obviously you do a good job of benchmarking your growers, and so you can uh, ebb and flow that to mm -hmm. the quality. How do you manage the whole grower side in terms of numbers, finding new ones and opportunity, um, that side of your business? Um, I use a guy in Northwest Iowa uh, that's worked with us for a long time that finds a lot of our growers. Um, but I personally, I go through all of our finishing barns, wean to finish barns uh, once a month, uh, so that have that relationship with our growers. Typically, a lot of them have built more farms themselves, or they got buddies uh, that'll bring them along our way. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that bonus program for the growers? Yeah, and that's uh, it's actually. Um, I've only been to this swine day one time before, and it happened to be uh, Rob Brenneman was the, the gentleman, and uh, he's actually the one who gave me the idea um, through this process here. But we have a, um, a structure system uh, that's based on um, average daily gain, feed conversion, what we call our day 50 bonus, which is that force pull bonus, late term deads, uh, percent of pigs marketed out the door, uh, and then it's a combination of if you hit four of the five bonuses, hit all five. And then I have another tier that's kind of what we call our best of the best. So guys that market, you know, 98, uh, my best grower, he'll be, you know, 98 and a half, 99% marketed. So, and then, so basically that. Um, and then we have a grower meeting every year, get together and, and uh, our grower of the year, he gets a, a cruise or a trip to Vegas plus cash. You know, second place gets a big chunk of cash and then we give TVs and things down the line. So simple, but it's effective. Longer term with your swine operation, do you see kind of your current uh, structure in terms of sows and what you're producing 
both short and medium term, or do you see that evolving over time? Or is that obviously as opportunities exist, but what is your longer term plan potential in the swine business? We would like to grow it. Um, as, as Doc brought up, I mean, labor is a big deal for us. So we're in the process of, of grooming a, a, another individual right now mm -hmm. under our current farm manager. And so hopefully in three or four years, we'll be ready to, to, to grow. Okay. You know, I, I'm not really in the camp of having four 25 pigs per sow, sow units. I'd rather have 132 and mm -hmm. grow it from there. Yeah. Any other questions for Grant? Yeah, John. Uh, mostly go to Sioux Falls, Smithfield, a um, little bit, um, Sioux City, um, but mostly there. How many different toll mills do you end up working with? Are you able to feed uh, most of those out of one location, or do you have most one? of them out of one, and then Minnesota comes out of another one? Okay. Yep. Use Ag Partners in Iowa. Okay. Yes, Jennifer. So the question was around labor, and uh, just to repeat that in case you didn't hear it, uh, what the industry should be doing to look at uh, not only availability but strengthening the total labor force for the swine industry? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's something we, we talk about on a daily basis. Um, you know, one avenue that we've started with, uh, with Kansas State, and it was on the feed yard side, but uh, I'm part of a peer group of uh, about 14 different cattle feeding organizations in the U.S., and uh, the idea came up, just uh, most of our conversations revolve around labor and, you know, how do we get, um, especially in our world, say on the cattle feeding side, for example, um, most of the kids that come to Kansas State Animal Science have never seen a feed yard, right? So how do we get them involved? So we started a program, it's, it was the uh, K-State Feed Yard Boot Camp program. Uh, it actually completed last week where kids actually get a credit hour course for it, internship program. They get scholarship money through it, but I think some small things like that that we can do at the university type level to get, you know, we don't have a, necessarily a struggle finding a warm body. It's, it's finding managers that are willing to train, develop people, keep the company out of trouble, um, that sort of thing. So that's what we've been focusing on. And, and going to the smaller universities, the Fort Hayes, where people are willing to live in southwest Kansas, uh, things like that's another avenue for us. We're also working on the, but we're working with the high school level as well. You know, where we're at in Southwest Kansas, for example, most of the teachers there, uh, with the programs that are um, available, most of the teachers there are from like Michigan, places where they don't have, they can't find a teaching job, so they bring in Southwest Kansas, hires them. They have no idea about production agriculture, so that's the avenue we're, we're approaching uh, is going to the, the high school level and trying to get those kids either on tours, you know, sponsorship deals, you know, allowing Caterpillar, local dealerships, John Deere dealerships, they're bringing out equipment, letting these kids play around with that stuff. I mean, they're just, they're big video games for that matter. Just getting them exposed to what's out there. I mean, production <laughs> ag, we pay, we pay well. Um, there's no doubt about that. All right, if no more questions, let's give Grant one last round of applause, really. <laughs>